This is Real Estate Rookie episode 137. Real estate just happened in the last year and nine months, roughly. Um, prior to that, it was pretty dark, like 13 years of probation from 15 to 28, prison, parole, rehab, things like that. Um, never expected to get into real estate. I didn't think that was something I could do. Uh, I didn't think that was obtainable. Um, and then running into a bigger pockets podcast from a you know Google search and uh, starting to get educated, started to realize that there may be an avenue for me to get in. That's that's kind of what got me here today. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host Tony Robinson. What's Ashley Kerr, what's Tony? going on? How are you doing? I asked you first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's going on with me? Let me see. Did, did I already talk about us surprising my son for uh, running ASB president? Um, you didn't tell I... us how it happened. You told us you yeah. were going to do it, but not yeah, yeah. So how it uh, went. <laughs> earlier this week, we found out that my son, he was running for eighth grade ASB class president. We found out that he won. Uh, so my wife and I decided to pick him up with a limo, pick him and his friends up, surprise him at school. Um, and it was, it was like such a great time. Like, like all the kids come out of school were like, Oh my God, there's a limo. Um, and he was, he was like initially kind of embarrassed. He's like, Oh my God, like all the attention's on me. But, uh, once we got in the limo and all his friends were in there, they were having a good time. So he, he was super appreciative. He thanked us like 20 times that day and lots of hugs and kisses from him. So it was, it was all worth it. That is uh, such a cool, unique idea. And the best part of it though, was Tony's wife, Sarah put on Instagram where, DJ Tony had to stop the music because he had to take a, a real estate call. <laughs> that shows the kids just like sitting there waiting for him. And he's just talking on the phone and then she played some cricket noise in the background. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Yeah. Typical real estate investor. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I'm looking here, forward uh, to the weekend. It's probably the last uh, sunny, really nice weekend uh, here in Buffalo coming up and, uh, we're going to go wake surfing, I think, on Saturday and probably be the last uh, boating, boating day of for, the season. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you guys go for hibernate Buffalo. for the next, like, three months or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, next week I'm going to Austin, Texas to the uh, conference FinCon. So, yeah, that should be fun and hopefully nice weather there. Yeah, beautiful. What, what's going on and in then, the business world, Ash? What Do you want to say where you, you're going? <laughs> Where oh I'm going well I'll be leaving to <laughs> Maui in uh, like three days now so going to hang out with uh, Brandon Turner the Maui Mastermind folks so excited for that so I'll have some good updates once I get back from that on on how my my business and my life has changed yeah so excited for you okay. well today uh, we have Sterling on the show and I think we could have just kept talking to him forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he had what like what a cool story Sterling has. Um, we had uh, Jason Peterson back on episode 129. And Jason and Sterling share some similarities in that they both spent some time in the prison system. They were incarcerated, um, but they neither of them let that setback stop them from setting their sights on becoming a real estate investor and just like totally crushing it. So Sterling's done like 10 deals. I think they're at 10 doors um, in like less than two two years. Um, so he's, man, so much inspiring content coming out of today's episode for sure. Yeah. Sterling actually mentioned that, you know, he started to get into trouble in his life at the age of 15, from 15 to 28, struggled. And then um, he's 30 now and just completely 180 his whole life. But uh, he breaks down the deal on his primary residence. You guys will not believe the interest rate that he is paying. I will tell you, it's more than 20% and less than 50%. So listen <laughs> in as to why this is actually not a bad thing at all for him, uh, the interest rate that he's paying on this loan. Um, but yeah, he just gives uh, tons of great little tips and so nonchalant. But uh, let's get Sterling onto the show. Sterling, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you start off telling everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Yeah. So I'm 30 years old. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. Um, like a super quick backstory to that. Real estate just happened in the last year and nine months, roughly. Um, prior to that, it was pretty dark, like 13 years of probation from 15 to 28, prison, parole, rehab, things like that. Um, never expected to get into real estate. I didn't think that was something I could do. 
Uh, I didn't think that was obtainable. Um, and then running into a bigger pockets podcast from a, you know, Google search and, uh, starting to get educated, started to realize that there may be an avenue for me to get in. That's, that's kind of what got me here today. Sterling, if you don't mind, can we touch a little bit more on your background? Because I want to highlight how real estate really is an avenue that anybody can get into, um, that you don't need a college degree, that you don't need experience, you don't need to have connections, that anybody can get started in real estate no matter what their background is. Absolutely. Um, So when I very first got started, I had saved up $3,000. And so I went to the Google gods and I asked them, how do I invest this to stop being poor? Um, you know, I was kind of raised poor and um, didn't, you know, just owning my own home was like a far out dream seemed, you know, pretty un- unattain- unobtainable at the you know position I was in. Um, ultimately, you know, started, like I mentioned, I started to get educated, started just consuming audiobooks, podcasts, any educational material I could get a hold of. And, you know, because of my record and because of my lifestyle prior to that, I had picked up skills along the way. I was a felon, so it's kind of hard to find work. Uh, I would do a lot of Craigslist jobs. I started to learn drywall and framing and uh, doing, you know, helping people with rehabs. And I started to pick up my own tools. Uh, so at that point, at the, you know, this, at, around Christmas 2019, um, I had some of my own tools. I was just working as a handyman. Um, and then when I started to do transition to actually looking for properties, like technically I went through a trailer park phase first, that's, that's all the money I thought I had. So it wasn't, you know, as cool as buying a whole trailer park or a mobile home park. Um, it was specifically an episode I had heard about a guy, you know, getting, uh, a mobile home, uh, inside of a, a mobile home park, fixing it up and then like seller financing it. Um, so that to me, I felt like that was something I could, I could accomplish. So that got me excited. So I think it took me three days to go through every mobile home park in the area to look for any of them that were beat up or empty or anything like that. Um, then it's kind of funny the way I really, did you drive oh, around? Yeah, absolutely. Did you drive around to all of these? Yeah. You put oh, in yeah, the like hardware. 10 hours a day. I was, I was, I mean, I still have the sheets and sheets of, you know, but that kind of broke me into using the county site to look up properties, look up back taxes, see when the last time it was sold and things like that. So I don't I don't regret any of it. I don't think that was a waste of time. Uh, but the conclusion I drew to that was when I actually found a couple that I could obtain, then it became I had to go get permission from the park. Um, my background kept me from getting in there in some cases. And it's, you know, my background is uh, my criminal background is drug trafficking. Um, no. People don't really care for that. <laughs> um, so were the mobile home park owners, the landlords doing background checks and credit checks on uh, the people that were buying the mobile yeah, homes? Yeah, sorry. That, that's, yeah, for me to even own it without even living there, I still would have had to pass that background check. And that was something I couldn't do. So I related owning a, a mobile home to basically like being on probation. <laughs> like the uh, mobile home park would be my probation officer. And so those feelings just instantly, I was, I was kind of over mobile homes and had to find another route. Um, so being in Dayton, Ohio, there is a lot of affordable housing. Um, there's still tons of vacant properties um, in downtown Dayton, the east side, west side, the surrounding areas. Um, so I started to shift towards that. And, you know, some of these houses sell for 5000 20000 um, You know, they need work, but that was where I saw my opportunity to add value to the situation. I could do um, a lot of things as far as fixing it up, getting it livable. And I would cut costs to get me to an after repair value and get me some equity. Sterling, I want to talk just a little bit, just set the table for the listeners about you know your, your current portfolio today. So how many properties do you have or how many deals have you done? So I've done four deals. Um, Rental property wise, we have 10 doors, two, four units and a duplex. And then uh, I managed to buy my own home as well. Um, so I have my own home without a mortgage. Wow. That is fantastic, man. And, and all this within the last like less than two years, you said. Yeah. yeah. That is that is fantastic. C- congratulations to you, Sterling, because I think that's a, a huge 
uh, accomplishment for anyone, but even more so given the, I think, complexities that came with your background. So one one question for me, Sterling, is if you look back to your social circle, you know, from the, the time that you spent uh, incarcerated and the folks that have also gotten out, you know, around the same time as you, maybe even before you, how many of them are doing what you're doing today? Uh, none that, that I can say for sure. Um, like the odds on these things aren't very good. So like to quit using drugs and stay, you know, not using the, the odds are, are not necessarily in my favor. Uh, to get out of prison and not go back, the recidivism rate is like four out of five within the first five years. Um, so there's not a lot of people that I had to look up to with my exact experience. Uh, there was, there's not still not a lot of relatable people. There is a few, um, and I, I don't want anybody to feel like it's impossible. Um, but like you just mentioned, there's, or like you had brought up the people I had to look up to, I, I had to go and create new relationships, um, ultimately. And and that's the point that I wanted to to really drill down on was the the creation of those new relationships. So before before we get to how you built those new relationships, because I don't think everyone's situation will be you know as maybe extreme is not the right word, but obviously everyone's not going to be coming from a background of being incarcerated. But I think a lot of people that are listening have a current social social circle that's either not supportive or doesn't understand real estate investing, and they let that social circle hold them back. So I, I guess the first question for you, Sterling, is. Did you have any doubt in yourself about whether or not you can make this happen, given your background? Like, did you have any self-doubt to say, there, I'm not seeing anyone else who's coming out of the prison system doing what I'm trying to do, so it must be impossible. And if you did feel that doubt, how did you push past that? Um, <clears throat> so I don't want to say, you know, just I immediately let it go. Um, so having like literally audiobooks and podcasts, um, those were my relationships for a really long time. Those were my mentors. Those are the people I looked up to. Like, I'm pretty sure I hear Brandon Turner's voice in my head when I think about real estate. It's just, <laughs> it's narrated by his voice. Um, so those, those were the initial people that I listened to, um, drew strength from things like that. Um, another part to that that I do want to touch on is at the end of last year, so the end of 2020, um, I had done a lot. <laughs> Let's just say that. So, you know, um, I actually let myself breathe. I think it was like, that's the best way to word it. I think it was January 7th, um, where I finally like in the kitchen here, like kind of broke down a little bit because I had been pushing so hard running from where I came from, um, that I hadn't let myself feel any achievement. Um, cause it didn't feel real. It doesn't feel, you know, from what I thought I deserved, uh, to what, you know, we, we were able to create, there was a really big disconnect there. I never thought I'd even be a homeowner, honestly, um, and things like that. So, so there was this kind of running from that poverty, running from that scarcity. How important do you think it is for anybody to celebrate their wins, to take that time and to, to breathe and to think about it and to celebrate what they have accomplished before even moving on to the next thing they're going to accomplish? I, I mean, it's I personally, I think it's really important. So uh, for me and my family, there's there's little things we'll do to celebrate. It's not massive, um, anything like that, but we will go out to eat or we will um, splurge a little bit here or there. We've taken a vacation, things like that to kind of celebrate and like reward ourselves for, cause a lot of work goes into it. And you know, that, that system of like, so sorry to kind of go backwards here, but I used to struggle. Like we, my family used to struggle. It, it, we struggled without like a reason. We just lived in struggle and struggle sucks. Um, now we struggle from time to time, but it's for a purpose. Um, and then when you, when we reward ourselves for that, after we've achieved it, especially if there's big hurdles and hurdles we didn't see coming, that's, that's like a routine building or, you know, helps build those positive habits. That's how I look at it. That is such a good point is that even there's two different kinds of struggle, like your past, how you struggled, but how you may go through times of struggling now, but that's because there's that end reward and you know that it, there's something coming at the end that you're struggling for the benefit 
such as buying a new property or, you know, something like that, where you maybe you're saving all your cash or a down payment and it is a struggle not going out to dinner or not being able to buy things or telling your kids no because you're saving for the future. There are those two different kinds of struggles. And I think that's so important that you bring that up because especially with social media, people get caught up and everybody winning, winning, winning. Well, there's a lot of people that are struggling to get to those wins and you can't, you know, you have to remember that for yourself or when you are struggling yourself, that it's for the end goal, that end destination, but you have to enjoy the journey too while you're going. So even though the struggle may be hard, like enjoy the journey as you're getting there to that next deal, that next property, that next closing, the next flip or whatever it is. So I'm really glad uh, you brought that up, Sterling. Thank you. I, I just, just before we move on, I just want to ask one thing about the the social circle piece, right? Um, you said that you've, you've, you know, you didn't have a lot of people in your social circle that were uh, successfully investing in real estate. You started with the podcast, you started with the, the audio books, you started with like just the educational component to kind of feed yourself the right information. But what about like in real life? Did you do anything like in the real world to start building some relationships with other people that could be potential partners or mentors or kind of guide you along the path? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So initially I didn't really recognize these people because um, I wasn't looking for them. So if you're not looking for it, you're not gonna find it. Um, but I had two, my last two bosses actually, uh, the guys that I'd worked for, uh, one was a commercial real estate attorney, never clicked in my head that that might, you know, be an awesome guy to learn from. I did, you know, he was a good person and I, you know, looked up to him in that way for the way he was with his family and other things. Um, and then the other guy, uh, my most recent employer, um, he flew planes for the army. He had some rental properties. I would work on his rental properties. Um, but it, it's still at that point, it was something that I didn't really think I would ever achieve. It was just, this is what I do. You know, I, I work on other people's stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then once that, uh, once those ideas started to take root in my mind, that's when it made it, you know, I kept those relationships going, but, you know, I'd never burned those bridges or anything. Um, but then I realized like, you know, I need to be hanging out with these guys more. These guys are doing, you know, what I want to do. These guys have the skills I need. Um, these guys are probably great people to work with. You know, I've already worked for them. I know how we interact. Um, so like those existing relationships that I had, those were kind of the first ones that they were the easiest to kind of dive into. Um, and then besides that, you know, local Dayton real estate investors network and, um, bigger pockets, um, anybody like, you know, this is my passion. So I could, I could literally talk to anybody about real estate all day. Sterling, do you remember that exact moment where you had that mindset shift? Like what changed you from being the employee, working on other people's stuff to being the person? I want to own this stuff. Yeah, it literally was the first episode of Bigger Pockets I listened to. And like, I, I remember where I was <laughs> and everything is nuts. Uh, December 24th, like Christmas Eve, I'm messing with Christmas decorations in the basement. I had it playing. And then that, you know, listening to that episode and, you know, all the, quotes get brought up and books get mentioned. And from there it was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then reading Cash Flow and uh, Richest Man in Babylon. And uh, for the longest time, like I thought I was broke. I thought I was broken, not broke. I'm, I'm still broke, but like broken. Um, and so, and it, it didn't dawn on me. I mean, shoot, it wasn't until this year that it dawned on me. It's like, I was, I don't think I was necessarily broken that whole, you know, my whole life. Like I was a crappy employee always been a crappy employee. Um, that's because I'm not an employee. That just never was who I am and um, didn't know there was another option. So it's like, oh, I just suck at being an employee. This is how life is. So, Tony and I actually just did a whole rookie reply episode on like being an employee versus an entrepreneur and how it took. Tony always knew it and he took being a W-2 to fast track him to being an entrepreneur. For me, I just hated life being an employee and it took me a while to actually realize just like you that it was I needed that shift like I was meant to be an entrepreneur and not to be a W2 employee. What would be your advice for somebody who maybe has just realized this now that they are not made to be an employee and that they need to be an entrepreneur? What's like some of the first steps they can take to get to that that entrepreneur, build that business, get 
out of their W-2? What are some action items you could give our listeners to take? So for me, you know, like from my experience, I wouldn't probably recommend this, but like for me, it was an easy jump because, you know, I didn't really have much going on at the job I had. Um, I still had side jobs that I could do for income. So I just turned it off. Like, nope, no longer an employee. I'm going to make this work. And if I don't, my life can't get any you know, more difficult than it already is. Um, like that bottom is always there waiting. Um, you know, if I have to get this job, work 40 hours a week, I know I'll be able to rent here and, you know, we'll survive. Um, so I was so close to that already. It, it was only like up, basically. The, the risk was very low of, <laughs> of it getting worse. But um, the thing that the thing that I wanted to bring up would be there is a time and place to be an employee. Um, you, you know, even still today, I will gladly go <clears throat> maybe not, you know, a full W2 job, but I will take work that doesn't necessarily pay great just because, you know, I'm either building a relationship, I'm learning a skill, I'm working for somebody who's an excellent entrepreneur and just being around them is going to rub off on me. Um, so I think there is still a time and a place for that employee, not necessarily employee mindset, but for that employee position when it can benefit you in so many other ways. And if you can integrate those things, that's the, that's the key. That, that's like one of the lessons in rich dad, poor dad, right? Is, is the rich don't work for money. And if you think about that story that Robert Kiyosaki told about his rich dad, the rich dad made him and his best friend work in the shop for free. Right. So they could learn the lessons, but not necessarily tie that work to actually getting paid because it's like, okay, if, if you build that habit of only going to work to get paid, then you're going to be an employee for the rest of your, of your life. But if you can use the work that you do as an as a avenue to gain knowledge, to gain skills, to build relationships, then that's the way that you kind of unlock the freedom that comes along with being an entrepreneur. So man, Sterling, what a, what a valuable lesson. And it seems like it's, it's worked out well for you so far, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> the most recent position I've got, you know, my long-term goals are commercial real estate, whether that's multifamily or, um, you know, triple net lease, you know, actual businesses running out the land or the, the buildings. Um, I got a contract with a business park locally and I do their, I do some maintenance for them, some new, like some tear out, rebuild, change the structure for, for the new tenants coming in. Um, but the guy I get to work with, you know, part of the agreement is he gets to, is he teaches me how those triple net leases work, how these things get billed back to tenants, how the costs of snow removal, uh, you know, landscaping, um, all the different things get put back into the leases and how they're divided and the way that you know, square foot and common areas and all these things are worked back into the lease and build back. So I don't if they want me to go up there and change a light bulb. I'm there, you know, I get to learn something and they get exposure to the people that, you know, run these places that they work with, how to coordinate these things. Um, and it technically pays probably the most I've ever made. So I'll take it. Sterling, that is awesome. And that's kind of how I learned was I worked for an, an investor as a property manager, leasing agent. I did some maintenance. I did everything and I was paid and I got to learn how to run an apartment complex and build a property management company. Uh, so that's awesome. Can you, you mentioned a triple net lease. Can you just explain to everybody what that is uh, in case anybody doesn't know? Yeah. Um, to the best of my ability, I'm still learning. So, um, you know, there's, there's, the term triple net lease, there's different levels to it. So there's a basic, um, you know, the tenant pays X amount per square foot, uh, things like, you know, depending on what the lease has worked out, um, if something breaks, the tenant pays to fix it. Um, there's a, like, you know, you can take that all the way up to like a true triple net lease where a Walmart comes in. They take over, they pay property taxes, they pay to fix the driveway outside, snow removal, everything. You you just rent to them, that's it. They pay for everything. Um, and that's that yeah. high level, yeah. <laughs> the, the only other thing I'd add to that is insurance too, that they cover the insurance too. Uh, the investor that I worked for, he did a couple triple net leases and it was uh, all the repairs and maintenance inside of the building uh, the insurance, the property taxes, and then uh, the owner was required to maintain the exterior of the property and the parking lot. So yeah, there's many different levels, but basically you're um, adjusting the rent 
and then having them include a, a bunch of expenses into their their lease that they're uh, responsible for. So if you take two properties, one that has a triple net lease and one that doesn't, the triple net lease, they're probably paying a lower rent than the person that doesn't have a triple net lease and doesn't pay into the property taxes, doesn't pay into the insurance. So some advantage of that is that you have the triple net lease. If property taxes are rising, insurance is rising, those built in um, increase, those are increases are already built into the lease agreement. So you don't have to estimate, oh, okay, like in two years, we'll raise the rent to this, thinking maybe property taxes go up this much or something like that. I don't know if we've really talked about Yeah, we haven't really. We might need to get like a commercial uh, expert on on here to kind of talk through that. Sterling, we're going to have to have you come (laughs) back. (laughs) Give me a few more months. A few more months. (laughs) Yeah, because you, before you came on, Tony Sterling was talking a little bit. Was this the commercial deal you were talking about? Uh, Yeah, this is the place I had mentioned. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So yeah, maybe in a couple uh, months, we'll have Sterling back on to talk about this commercial deal. Sterling, one thing I, I'm curious about is how are you financing the deals that you've done? Technically, I haven't been able to afford any of the places that I have ownership in. Um, so with the investment properties. I think that's yeah. a lot of yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just real quick as well, um, because I've been self-employed and then also haven't made much money. There's a really big hurdle, at least going in to get to get bank financing. So, you know, I've got a house with a bunch of equity trapped in it. And it sounds really cool to say I don't have a mortgage, but I could be using that money so effectively. So, well, you know, whatever it happens. How do you not have a, how do you not have a mortgage? How did you uh, purchase your house? Uh, so a it's just a private loan that I got and it like 25% oh, cool. interest, but at a fixed rate, like fix, yeah, whatever, three year payback. 25% yeah. interest. Oh, my dad's ruthless. So it, that's whatever. It's like a loan <laughs> shark. Okay. Well, let's, st- let's, <laughs> I want to dive into this loan shark, your dad. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, this got you into a property. Yeah. Right? yeah. I have no complaints. And it's the numbers are still working out for you. Like you can, uh, if for these payments, you've, uh, you've built some equity into the property. You've added value. I, Cause I think people are going to get so hung up. I mean, even my first reaction was 25%. Oh my gosh. But if the numbers still work and the, your end game of this property works with that 25% and that's better than you renting somewhere and that's how you got into this property, then who cares about the 25%? Yeah, there was zero hesitation. Um, we can just go into it real quick if that's cool with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. The, the house that we moved into, the house that we bought, um, the purchase price is $20,000. Um there's a little bit of backstory to that. She was about to lose it to a, a basically a tax foreclosure. Um, people, I'd known of this house for a while and she didn't want to sell it. Um, she didn't want to lose her stuff. Well, she was about to lose her stuff. So the way that I solved that problem was agreeing to put her stuff in storage for a year until she could get to it. Um, so that was the little <clears throat> problem I solved that got me in where nobody else could get in. Uh, so Pert. By yeah, listening. If, we, if we can pause on that just for a second, because I, I don't want to gloss over that, yeah. that important piece, Sterling. Um, you found, and, and so let me take a step back. In today's market, right, everything's going like selling like hotcakes, right? There's so much competition in every market, but there are still sellers who are in distressed positions. And if you can go in and solve a problem for them, then you have an opportunity to get that property at a discount. To you, the idea of putting someone's stuff in storage for a year is a very simple fix, right? To you, it's not that big of a deal. But to the other person, to the person who owned that property, it was a huge problem for them, a problem big enough that they were willing to give you a discount on the property if you helped them solve it. So if you have an opportunity, and I'm talking to the listeners now, if you have an opportunity to talk face-to-face with the seller about a property, the more information you can gather about their situation, about their potential obstacles, the better position you're in to create a win-win situation. I can't remember who who came up with this. I think I heard in like an old marketing podcast, but whenever you're talking directly to a seller, you wanna be what's called a PIG, P-I-G, you wanna be a PIG. And PIG stands for professional information getter. Professional information getter. And the better you can be at that, the better job you can do of creating a win-win situation. And Sterling, it sounds like you got a a heck of a deal by being able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And, you know, the total cost for storage for a year, 1600 bucks. That's fine. 
Um, and it goes back into, you know, these costs that most times I would have been like, you know, I don't want to pay this. I don't want to pay 25% interest. Um, we'll go through the numbers real quick. So I bought it for 25,000. Um, at this point I'd saved up a couple bucks and started getting my credit together. Um, and started getting some credit limits. So I like spent everything I had maxed out all my credit cards to get this house, um, fixed up. I had let knowing I was, you know, once this house was under contract and we had made through a couple bumps that, you know, now I know we're going to close my uh, lease on the house I was renting was expiring. And so I let it expire. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, don't want to get too far into this, but so, you know, I made plenty of mistakes, I'm sure. But anyways, uh, I put 30,000 into it. Like to date, I'm about 30,000 into it and that I get to save a lot. Um, not time, but money because I did a ton of work myself. Um, some 20 hour days, some 22 hour days, you know, because of that time crunch, because I let my lease expire and I have a family that needs a house. So that happens. Um, so the ARV, when I bought the house and this, you know, COVID factor, COVID appreciation factors in a little bit to it. And that's my term for it, but that timeline of how things have gone up uh, in value. Um, the initial ARV that I was anticipating uh, was $115,000. So already right there, you know, being 20,000 purchase price, 5,000 in interest, um, and 30,000 into it, it's 55, 115 ARV. That's a $60,000 gain. And I was able to do this in a little over two months. Um, so that was, that's like a crazy awesome win, um, factor in the appreciation that, you know, current market value, um, is 155,000 and it's a ridiculous jump, but you know, that puts it like almost to a hundred thousand dollars in in equity created. Um, so, I, you know, then just looking forward, I still can't get the mortgage or the, you know, the bank loan at the moment to pull that money back out. There's a worst case scenario, which isn't that bad is, you know, June of this coming year, I'll be able to sell the house and take that money. Um, not as a long or short term capital gains, but um, as my primary residence, I can pull that money out without having to pay those, you know, high tax rates and put that into another property or an investment property or however. So that would be uh, two years that June 2022 would be two years you were in that property to take the gain as tax free. Yep. As my primary. So, yeah. 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 That's so awesome. Congratulations. $100,000 in equity built yeah. into this property. It makes the interest rate not sound so bad. So. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's like the whole point. I'm glad you dove into the numbers because without, if you still would be renting at your other place because you didn't want to pay 25% interest, you wouldn't have that and you'd be throwing your money away at rent every month where you built in $100,000 in equity that hopefully you can use in the future or even if you sell it, you can take it and, and use it. That's really awesome. Uh, the payment's only $50 more than my rent was. Wow. So, it, yeah. Wow. Okay, so what's another deal? How have you uh, financed okay, your Okay, so all deals? the other deals, I have a actual business partner. Um, we have an operating agreement now and, you know, all those official things. So my business partner, he, he uses money from a self-directed uh, Roth IRA. So he got that set up by a company. He's the manager of the company that manages his money. And then uh, me and him work together. He can't actually touch the properties in the sense of fixing it up, doing anything to them. So that's where I come in. But he can manage the money, basically. So that's how me and him work together. Yeah, let's just break that down real quick. So a self-directed IRA, it's uh, like a tr traditional IRA that you can take and you go to a company that sets it up for you. There's a, a ton of them out there. I think on biggerpockets.com, they actually have uh, some that are recommended on there, but you can go and you basically give them your IRA and the money in it and they turn into a self-directed IRA. So instead of investing into the stock market, you can use it to purchase real estate. Um, and like Sterling mentioned, like you, if it's your IRA, you can't actually touch the property or, you know, do the renovations or anything like that. That's why it works out that you guys are partners. What does your operating agreement look like? What's the, the structure you guys uh, have put so together? The, the company that me and him have together is a multi-member LLC. Um, you know, one of the first things I did, I probably did it wrong, but, um, first things I did getting educated and like, you know, listening to, um, 
you know, whatever, all the audio books, real estate books was I went and made a sole proprietorship. So I, I went and made an LLC and it just was something to do more at that time uh, than, than any like real purpose. So, um, so my LLC and then he manages his uh, self-directed IRA through an LLC as well. So our two LLCs uh, own a member, multi-member LLC. And then we had an attorney draft the uh, 28 page operating agreement. And that spells out both of our uh, responsibilities, our limits on what we can do, um, you know, who's the managing member, who's, you know, who's in charge of what. And that's, that's an official document that if me, you know, God forbid something happens and me and him ever fall out, you know, we have that operating agreement to go back on who owns what, who is responsible for what. And that was something we felt that was really important just to have done correctly. The, the operating agreement, I think, is, a, is an important like, document to have whenever you're getting into business with someone else. Um, I, I think the one thing that I'll add on to that, Sterling, is that the, the operating agreement is also something that can change over time, right? Um, like we've got our operating agreement for like our LLC, but then we've also got like joint venture agreements for every property that we purchase with someone else. And, um, that joint venture agreement has morphed and changed after almost every single deal. Like every time we close on something, we realize, okay, oh shoot, we should have included that as well. Or, oh man, this didn't really make sense last time. So let's make sure we do it this way the next time. So, um, for those of you that are listening, don't feel like you necessarily have to get it right the very first time that you sit down to do it. Like you can always make amendments or changes to any agreement as long as both parties agree to it. Um, one, one, and this is kind of like a tactical, very detailed question, but one that I know comes up a lot. Um, Sterling, how did you find that attorney and what kind of attorney did you use? Did you go to like a criminal defense attorney? Did you go to like a real estate syndication attorney? Did you go to like a family court service attorney? Like who did you go to and how did you find that person? So the real estate agent that we bought that for, um, our first investment property from, uh, the attorney that settled, um, the guy who had deceased, that was his, you know, his property. The attorney that settled that is who we went to to ask. It just so happened he used to, I'm going to get it wrong, but let's just say he used to work for the city um, as, you know, in real estate. Uh, maybe he worked in probate or something like that. Like he, he's had law uh, jobs in real estate for, you know, his whole career. And so he, while he does do other things, I don't believe he does criminal or anything like that, but, you know, he just whipped up the, you know, 28 page agreement, like it was nothing. Um, yeah. So we felt we had the right guy. And to your point, we have to update our stuff at the end of this year. Um, ownership percentage has changed. Uh, some of me and his terms changed of how we how we do business now. And it's just something you just make an amendment to it. And yeah, keep it rolling. Awesome, man. Uh, but yeah, because I, I think some people get confused when they hear attorney. There's like so many different types of attorneys you can go to. Like if someone only does family court services, like like family law, like if their focus is divorces and like custody, maybe don't go to them to help draft the the operating agreement for your real estate business, right? You want someone with a little bit of, of specialty, right? That's, that's almost like going to, a, I don't know, like a foot surgeon if you're having heart issues, you know, like you want to go to the person that's got like the right, the right focus there. All right. So enough of, with the weird analogies. Come on, here. David Green with I these know. analogies. <laughs> <laughs> enough with my weird analogies. Let's, uh, let's talk about how you actually found this partner, Sterling, because I think, you know, Ashley and I talk a lot about the partner or about the power of partnerships. Um, and, you know, her and I both leverage partnerships in our own businesses. So I think, like the the golden goose for a new real estate investor is finding that partner that's got a ton of capital that's willing to give it to you as this rookie investor. So Sterling, how the heck did you get so fortunate to find uh, a partner like this? Uh, I want to say sheer luck, but there was a little bit of intention to it. Um, <clears throat> so he actually, you know, I had found a deal. Um, I had a, you know, a former boss that I wanted to work with. We talked about it. You know, we planned on working together, uh, because of his job, he got called out of the country. His wife didn't want to handle it. And I totally agree. You know, that's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff to take on, especially when, if, if it's not your wheelhouse. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that you hear on bigger pockets quite frequently is let people know what you're doing. Um, if people don't know what you're doing, they can't do anything good or bad. Um, to help you. Um, so this guy, the house I was renting, 
he, this guy had purchased the house next door, you know, years prior. He had been slowly fixing it up for his kids to live there while they went to college. And me and him had always just talked in passing and never about much. Um, well, after the guy that I intended on doing my first property with, um, after he got called away, I had already mentioned that property to my neighbor or to the guy that owned the house next to me that was fixing it up. And so he, you know, my potential future partner gets called away. Um, well, I told that to the guy, you know, like, Hey, you know, Matt has to go out of the country. Now I, now I need to find somebody that can do this with me. This, you know, this is what we were going to do. I was going to fix it up. He was going to pay for it. We'd split whatever the equity gain was. And he's like, he just came out of nowhere. Like, well, let me ask my wife if she's, if she's down, you know, if she's game. And, um, I was shocked, just like stone cold shocked. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, cool. So like, of course, you know, it takes like a week to find, you know, to hear back from him. Finally, we don't even have each other's phone numbers. And, um, <clears throat> I like see him a week later and he just hollers over the fence. Like, yeah, she said she's down. You're, you know, let's do this. We didn't even know how much the place costed yet. Um, I just like, we didn't have a final price on it, anything. Um, so from there, that is just what I was super lucky in that sense. And then super lucky that it turns out he's a super fair, easy to deal with professional partner. Um, but that luck was kind of created by intentionally letting people know what I was doing. So that that last sentence, Sterling, is exactly what I was about to point out, is that the luck was intentionally created by the actions that you took. Had you not, A, already been hustling to try and find the deal, right? That was the very first step. You had to hustle hard enough to find this good deal. B, you had to be confident enough and, and you know, I guess just like social enough to talk to this random guy who owned this house next to you that you only saw every once in a while about, you know, the goings on in your real estate business. And then B, you had to kind of have the courage, not even necessarily to tell him, you know, hey, do you want a partner, but at least to express the the situation that you you found yourself in. And it was all those things kind of coming together that allowed you to find this partner. And I think what a lot of rookies don't believe yet is that there are so many people in your circle currently that have a desire to invest in real estate, but have never told you about it. Like, I guarantee that for everybody that's listening, they can probably, you know, there's probably five people in their life that have always wanted to invest in real estate, but have never verbally said it out loud. So if Sterling is the one that's on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, at the cookouts, at the wherever, you know, at the grocery store, talking about real estate all the time, eventually you're going to bump into one of those people that have had that thought in the back of their mind that they want to get started in real estate investing, but they don't have the time, the desire, the knowledge, whatever, but they have the money. Right. And then you guys can be the perfect partnership. So, man, Sterling, I absolutely love, love, love that example, man. Thanks. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I guess well, one last question on the on the partnership side, Sterling. Um, what advice do you have for someone that's looking to to get into real estate investing, leveraging the power of partnerships? Like, is there anything that you feel that you would have done differently going into this or lessons that you've learned so far now that you guys have done a few deals together? Um I mean, for us, it worked out great. Like I mentioned, he's, I, <clears throat> I did my best to like, you know, do this with the best of my ability, be transparent with the money make sure I didn't screw anything up, make sure that I did everything right. Um, for me personally, it was because, you know, I have a criminal background. If I go and screw up a business relationship, I don't, I won't have much uh, in my corner after that. But, you know, me and him, we did. I mean, we did the first three, four months working together, basically on a handshake. There was no operating agreement yet. Um, we just had a few talking points. I think he might have, you know, Googled a promissory note at some point because he was sending me the the money to buy the materials to fix things up. Um, I think the the best advice besides any emotional intelligence or relationship factors would be finding that deal. The partnership would have never happened if I didn't find something that was worth pursuing on for me and for him. And everything else I've found, uh, deal wise, there seems to be somebody ready to go um, if it's a good enough deal. Sterling, uh, I want to take us to our rookie deal review. And I was wondering if you could tell us about your self storage facility. 
that you yeah so i don't technically have ownership of that i was still an employee at this time but i'd I'd be happy to yeah let's talk about it though yeah yeah let's break that down because i that experience is still uh i think has probably given you kind of a leg up that you feel confident you could do this on your own someday (laughs) yeah that definitely yeah down the road made me realize that so Oh, yeah. And even you don't have to break down the numbers or anything like that. If you, But if you just want to tell us how it was approached and how you did it, because you knocked down a, a building. Uh, just everything on the inside and some offices. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell <laughs> us that story. I want to hear we that just story. knocked down everything on the inside, a couple of offices. <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, yeah. So that was the last guy I'd worked for and the guy that I just mentioned partnering with. So he had bought an old. CNC shop or plumbing shop or something. And he, his intention was to turn it into self storage. I had been working for him for maybe, you know, nine months, you know, almost a year. Um, I was the only guy that worked for him. So I, I think he knew I was going to do it. Um, I just didn't know he was going to have me do it yet. So he got me, he brought me in, you know, this is the building I bought, it's the warehouse I bought, whatever. Um, I want to turn this into self storage. And the way my mind works is like, if you give me a problem, I have to, my brain has to come up with at least plausible solutions or, you know, potentials or ideas, whatever. Um, I think he knew that too. So he just kind of let me loose in there. He's like, yeah, we need to, you know, turn this into, you know, he started doing market research. What's, uh, what's available locally. Is it five by fives, five by tens, 10 by twenties? What, you know, what, what's the market, you know, and, and actually letting me kind of do those things with us. How many cars are driving down the street? How many, you know, what's all these little data points that come in with self storage. And he had done a ton of research into it, but I actually got to design the place. So I actually got to come up with how we're building the units, how many units there's going to be, um, the width of the aisles, the lighting, like every aspect of it. Um, you know, we had to have an architect come out and and create plans and, you know, official things to present to the city. Um, just want to brag real quick. The architect was three feet off. My measurements were exact. Uh, <laughs> I don't get to say that often, so. <laughs> but, but yeah, so it it took me, I think about three months uh, from start to finish. And I literally did 95% of it by myself. I was there 14, 16 hours a day. He kind of baited me into if I got it done by, you know, Christmas or the end of the year. Um, I think I got, you know, a bonus. Um so you know, I got it knocked out really quick, um, <clears throat> but building somebody else's like you know, I didn't buy the place, um, so I didn't bring that to the table. But designing it, coming up with everything except for like pricing, basically, um, I created that place, and that felt good and bad, I guess. Like knowing you can do that, but not having the resources to do it, and that is kind of one of those early, early things that started to maybe get my mind pointed in the right direction and get me uh, to understand that I actually do have some skills that bring value. So I don't know what other details you'd like. I'll tell you whatever. But well, also think about how if you did this on your own first, you wouldn't have had his guidance. You mentioned he showed you how to look at the data points and different things you should be considering, like, you know, traffic through there and, you know, what size units built, things like that. So I, I've had a a similar experience where I got to do new development working for another investor and I learned so much. And if I would have went and done that on my own by myself, I would have made so many mistakes. And we made mistakes, even me and the investor on the, the new builds that we did. I can't imagine if I did it on my own. But I think as you go on, you know, each development, you learn more and more and you get more lessons out of it. And even though you or I don't have ownership over those buildings, the we were paid to do it. We learned a lot of lessons, took a lot of value from it. Um, so I, I think that's really awesome. And I, I don't want people to get hung up on opportunities that are out there where, yes, you may not have ownership of it, but it is a great, great opportunity still to learn so that when you do have ownership of something, you can be the best that you can be because you have that experience. So um, back to that's yeah, awesome. Oh, yeah. Well, and back to working for relationships and skills. Um, so he just bought another uh, property to do the same thing, and this time uh, it should turn into ownership. Um, so that 
you know, it created that opportunity in the future that I didn't know about yet, too. That, that's a, another great point there, too. Uh, my guy is now my private yeah, money lender. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. And the, yeah, the, and the, the network and the develop, uh, just everything that you can get out of um, working for somebody and getting that experience. Um, I, for rookie investors, it's something I can't preach enough that if you really do want to get out of your W-2 right away, then find a job where you're going to get that experience, that mentorship, and get paid to do it and to learn. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm going to take us to our rookie request line now. Anybody can call in at one eight 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 five rookie and leave a voicemail for Tony and I, and we may play it on our show for a guest to answer. So, Sterling, are you ready for today's question? Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Nocell. I currently live in northern New York with the Army, and I'm going to be getting out this summer and moving back to Ohio. Uh, I'm looking for a value-add duplex when I move in, and I'm thinking of, to continue to burr the duplexes as I go. My question is, what's the difference between a uh, refinance on an existing loan and a HELOC, and when would I use those? Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, well, the first major problem, I'm here in Ohio already. He's, you don't want to come back. It's, okay. <laughs> the fishing's way better. <laughs> well, I'm in I'm in New York, so I'm not sure he should stay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, I love the idea. Like value adds my specialty. Um, for him, the the advice I would give to him, I, he mentioned the army. I don't know if you know that should be brought up more or looked into farther because. Um, being a part of the military uh, drastically changes some, a lot of advantages that you get when getting loans. Like if you've ever applied for something, they ask, are you a member of the military? I've never got to click that box, but from what I understand, it's, it's a good one to be able to check. Yeah. Um, yeah you can get a, a VA loan where it's 0% down. So let's say in this scenario, Andy gets a VA loan um, to purchase the property and then he's added a bunch of value and wants to, should he refinance out of that um, VA to pull out the extra equity or should he get a line of credit on the, the property? What would be your recommendation, Sterling? Uh, I would really look into the refinancing personally, because <clears throat> another thing, like I said, I'm not, this isn't my wheelhouse, my specialty, but from my understanding, uh, the VA loans also allow you to refinance every time there's an opportunity to make the loan better. So whether there's you know money to be pulled out for a rate to be lower, I mean you can refinance I think multiple times in a year even. Um, so there's you know his turnaround maybe way quicker on the refinance um, versus a, a home equity line of credit and more substantially advantaged, especially if he goes that route of using the VA loans. Yeah, I think um, you you do hear this question all like HELOC versus refinance. Um, I feel like it depends on, on the situation, right? Like say that your say that your current interest rate, maybe you locked in like at the very, very bottom and you've got like a sub 3% interest rate, right? Say he's at like 2.5% on a 30 year fixed. If I've got that on a property, I don't know if I would want to refinance it because there's a chance that it could be higher than what I'm paying. So you'd kind of have to weigh the difference of is the cash that I'm getting out worth the increased interest rate that I'm paying? Um, the, I think the benefit oftentimes, and actually you can probably speak to this more intelligently than I can, but, um, from what I've seen, like we're trying to get a line of credit, not a, not a home equity line of credit because it's not on an investment property, but the loan to value ratio on the lines of credits tend to be a little bit lower than what you can do on a cash out refinance. So you can tap into more of the equity if you're doing a cash out refinance versus doing a, a traditional home equity line of credit. Like, have you seen something similar on your side, Ash? Yeah. So if you, if I were to go and refinance my house right now, I could pull out 80% of the, the, the equity in it. Um, but if I were to go and get a line of credit, like keep my existing mortgage and go and get a line of credit, I could potentially go up to 95% or 85%. Um, you have that, um, it, they'll go up higher when you have that mortgage and then the line of credit instead of just doing a, a mortgage for the whole refinance for the loan to value. Yeah. So shop around, uh, Andy, hopefully you'll find kind of which one makes the most sense for your situation. So, um, 
Awesome answer, Sterling. I want to take us into our Ricky Rockstar. So if you want to get shouted out as a Ricky Rockstar on the Real Estate Ricky podcast, uh, be sure to join the Real Estate Ricky Facebook group where 30,000 plus people strong or get active in the Bigger Pockets Real Estate forums or pulling people from there as well. Um, lots of like my life li- literally changed by being active in the Bigger Pockets forum. So if you guys aren't in there, you're missing out big time. <clears throat> Today's uh, Ricky Rockstar is Lane O'Neill. And Lane um, and Lane's dad uh, got their first property flipped. Um, took them a little longer than they expected, uh, but they did 95% of the work themselves. Um, they learned a-, a lot along the way, but they realized the hardest step was the very first step. Um, so they bought this property for $100,000, spent another $32,000 on the rehab, and then they were able to sell that property for $197,500. So a pretty good spread on the very first flip. So Lane, congrats to you. That is awesome, Lane. Uh, nice work. Sterling, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Can you uh, tell everybody where they can reach out to you and find some more information about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> feel free to reach out to me on Bigger Pockets. Uh, I try to be as helpful on there as possible. And then uh, I'm not great at social media, but I have a, my own website, it's just sterlingshrout.com. And same thing. I try to help out wherever I can. Awesome. Thank you. This has been a, a great episode. Uh, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and giving our listeners great value and to Tony and I too. I'm Ashley at Wealth from Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Make sure you join us on Facebook and check out the biggerpockets.com forums, or you can search uh, Real Estate Rookie on Facebook and join that group too. Thank you guys. And we will see you on Saturday for a rookie reply. Still your-